Okay, so let's start discussing. Okay, so hopefully you have gone over the first page. Yeah, so this one is under week 12, I think so, yeah. yeah. You can go to the modules, the latest week, you should get this one. Okay, so yeah, as I told you, these were like created by Dr. Tyagi and I'm using those with some annotations from my side, especially the YouTube videos. Okay, so anyone wants to like share anything after reading through this first page of what they think about it or, or, or were there any questions from here which you probably asked yourself while doing the nine to Tetris part? Actually, I did have like two questions that were like i guess i haven't read it fully so it's not completely addressed yet but like they were mentioned in these bullet points um i think the first one was like how does it save like information when it's powered off since like it's supposed to be an on and off signal saving stuff mm -hmm. and then the second is um the discrepancy between the theoretical amount of memory and what it actually is okay great questions so we will answer both the uh, so one of those questions the second question is on the aspect of designing a virtual memory why at all we had to come up with this concept of virtual memory when we already had a physical memory and to uh, and we will have a dedicated lecture on virtual memory to answer the first question, we will come to that in some upcoming slide, uh, upcoming pages here. It is to deal with volatile and non-volatile memory. So your memory can be categorized based on if they can retain their data or not. Okay, so those so these are the questions you need to like think about when we because so far Nantu Tetris was created in no sense that okay we want you to teach the fundamentals of all that, but you are coming from a software programming background. So there are naturally some things that you have observed in your software engineering process, which kind of created this gap where you realize that everything in memory is fixed. Then how do you get that much amount done in these limited resources? So we are going, going to bridge that gap through the sequence of advanced topics we are going to start today. Okay. And understanding these concepts and my opinion should help you and software programming as well because once you're able to once you get to identify that that whatever things we have introduced to make these mappings most of these are from a software perspective okay so so if you're getting some faults or if, if your memory is not fit if your program is not fitting in a memory what does it mean in terms of all that or if you have a lots of programs with you how does the computer ensure that every time you have an app, it gets a dedicated space in the RAM to get loaded, right? So we're going to answer all those questions. But so these are the details of how we are going to deal with memories and everything. And then here you, uh, we would talk about what does it mean to be a 64-bit machine versus a 32-bit machine? So these days, all machines are like mostly 32-bit or 64-bit. This comes up when you're downloading some software and then you have an option to download a 32-bit package or a 64-bit package, right? So what does it mean for a computer to be 64-bit? Well, in this case, it basically means all instructions are 64-bit, right? Unlike your hack computer, which is a 16-bit architecture, well, addresses are 16-bit. Here, addresses are 64-bit. And that gives us uh, this value where we realize that, oh, 64-bit addresses means I can have two raised to power 64 bytes. Now, if you, so here, the definition here is that every register is by default a byte, right? So if it's a byte addressable memory, that means if every register is a byte, that means eight bits, then we have two raised to power 64 registers or bytes that can be reserved or can be addressed through 64 bits, right? And if you solve this, it is basically 16 exabytes. So we're going to learn about these memory units as well. Like we have learned about kilobyte, we have learned about megabyte, we have not learned about gigabyte. So what is an exabyte, right? So, so we're going to talk about these memory units as well. 
And then there's this disparity that is quite obvious that while your machine would generate this much byte of memory, but your hard drive these days, suppose is 512 GB, right? Okay, so if you have so much memory that you can create using 64 bit, then how does it work with a limited 512 GB hard drive, right? So we're going to talk about this concept as well. And then if you remember uh, one of our discussions on memory hierarchy, where I give you, gave you this analogy of like kitchen HEB, and then you have to go to the HEB every time to get some ingredient. And if you do this process during, while you are cooking, it's going to take a lot of time. So what you do is you go once, you bring all the data and then you store it temporarily in different memory locations, which are close to your CPU. Right. So, so far we have discussed in, H, in NAND, in hack computer, we have discussed only two types. One is on chip registers, which are AND, and then they are like RAM, right? But between these two, there's also a sequence of memory locations called as cache. So if you are, if, if you have looked into the tech specs while buying a laptop, there's something called as L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache. So these are like different levels of cache which are there between your on-chip registers and your physical memory. So we're going to discuss why did we have to rely on these intermediate storage locations for our design, okay? Okay, and then, uh, yep. So this topic uh, was a quick overview of what it means in terms of load, uh, like st the starting up sequence for a computer. So far we're talking about, okay, running a program and blah, 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 everything. But if we have to backtrack and start from, okay, what happens once you switch on the computer? What all processes goes behind the scenes before you can use any application on your computer. So these are the sequence of steps that goes into that processing, okay? So let's go over each of this carefully and try to understand what's happening. So step A is you press the power button, okay? So that's a physical element. You just press it on your computer. Earlier it was on CPUs, now it's on your keyboard. You can press your computer and it wakes up or it starts, right? So that is step A. Step B basically means that whatever physical power is being supplied to your computer, it can be either through a battery or it can be from a wall socket, right? Which is the power line. So once that power enters your physical device, be it a smartphone or a computer, now from zero, when the system was completely shut off, you suddenly have so much power coming into your system. So what happens is this power is fed into your CPU and in your CPU, there are so many in your, so, so, so CPU is a device which has all these elements. You see, you have small, small registers, you have caches, you have your processor, okay? So every device, is everyone familiar with the term motherboard? Okay, so, so earlier, like if you have us, if, if we talk about your desktops and everything, right? So you have a different device with your CPU. Once you open it, there is this one board, which is called as motherboard where everything has been like plugged in, right? If there's, a, there's a chip for everything which is there on this one board, which we call as motherboard. So once your power line takes that signal, then every device on that motherboard, be it a, any chip or a, mem a register, has its own voltage at which it operates, right? And that and th that is what happens when you supply a power line, there's a sudden fluctuation. And after that, everything stabilizes. So what happens during that, st during that stabilization phase is the voltage that is required for every device to work gets stabilized. So not every element is working at the same voltage level based on their power consumptions, right? So, so that is what it's called as power supplies to various power domains and it stabilizes. 
So if any issue is going to happen related to electricity, it is to go. It is to ha- It is going to happen in the first few uh, nanoseconds or seconds. Why? Because if I have to show you how it looks like, we will have something like this before it stabilizes, right? And if this is time, after this point, power voltage for every element stabilizes. But here there is a sudden surge. Now, if anything has to go bad in terms of burning up your some resistors or whatever capacitors in your circuit, it is going to happen here. So this is a very critical phase that you hope that your computer successfully survives this sudden power surge into your computer system, right? And then there is this notion of clock signal, right? So once your voltage and the power line stabilizes in your computer, now the clock, so so far we have talked about a clock as tick tock cycles, right? And if your so this is one cycle, right? And if you see here, every cycle, every half cycle is of same time period. That means your half cycle, so you, so this is called as 50% duty cycle, which basically means your rising and falling edge. So if you take one clock cycle, the amount of time it is on and the amount of time it is off in that one cycle, it is same, 50% each, right? So, so that is done by, a device, uh, something called as phase lock loop. You can Google it, phase lock loop. So with a phase lock loop, what happens is your clock signal is stabilized for which your computer needs to operate at. So if it's a 50% duty cycle, it has this constant uh, pulses of same time period, right? That is what happens when it means that your clock signals are synchronized. And that we know from our project three and sequential circuits, the purpose of this clock signal. Then there is something called as processor reset pin. Now what happens is internally, the re, there's something called as a reset where this reset goes through. So once the reset is on, it is called as assertion. And the, when reset is off, it is called as uh, deassertion. Okay. Now, what it basically means is for every device, for memory and everything, right? So you need to make sure that everything is reset before a new phase of execution starts. Because you're powering up the computer, all your memory memory elements have to be reinitialized so that you do not pick up any garbage values from here and there when there's a new boot up sequence happening, right? So this is called as reset phase where your computer memories are refreshed and everything is initialized. And once this deassertion is done on the reset pin automatically, only then your actual execution is starting. Okay. And then if you see E, right? So probably you might have heard of this BIOS ROM, okay? So BIOS basically starts stands for basic input output system. So it is kind of a program which is already loaded into your ROMs, right? And we will learn in these upcoming pages that ROM is basically read-only memory, right? That means you cannot write onto the ROM you can only read it from the ROM. And ROM is kind of a non-volatile in the sense that even if you switch off your device, whatever is stored in the ROM is retained when you switch the computer back on, right? So it's kind of a non-volatile memory. There's another type of memory called as volatile memory. So as the name suggests, anytime this computer is switched off or the power supplies uh, removed, the contents of that memory are lost. Okay, so in that case, your BIOS program is lo- is always loaded onto the ROM. Okay, so when you switch on the device, and this, and all these happens in like nanoseconds. So, so if you have used your Linux or if you used the older OSs OS, 
you might have seen these boot up pages coming up. Like if you have used Linux machines a lot, like I have used it a lot during my undergrad, so I could see the bio setup page even before the OS loads. Okay, so so yeah, you can watch this video as well, and there are some more videos along those lines. But the whole idea is you you start your BIOS code, right? And what happens is this BIOS code does basic test of all devices connect to the CPU. So the purpose of the BIOS is to check if all the devices which are connected to the computer, like a keyboard, your memories, your mouse, your screen, is everything perfectly working on. So it's like checking if all the elements are working before the user can use this computer. So that is the purpose of BIOS, right? It does all these basic testing on all devices connected to the CPU. So to do that, so this is where it happens. So the BIOS is loaded into your BIOS is loaded from your disk, right? Into your physical main memory, right? So you can keep a track of what is happening in the main memory. And then once that BIOS check is done, BIOS copies a bootloader. So now what happens is there is a, so this disk has a bootloader OS kernel. Now you should know that depending on what OS your computer has, it has to be first loaded into your physical memory so that all applications can run. And that's why if you have like a dual boot system, you, you might have come across this term that, oh, my computer has a dual booting. That means I run both Windows and Linux in the same computer. So in the boot up sequence, you have an option to toggle between the two. And that's what is happening here. So if you have only one copy for a single OS, that gets copied into this one, main memory, G. So everything has to be loaded into the main memory so that it can execute, right? So you bring it from the disk, which is your hard drive, right, HDD, and you load it into a physical memory. So it everything is happening automatically, right? And then it makes a copy of the OS for that instance in which it is going to run, right? So that is what happens in step H, right? So we call it as a kernel, which is a program for the OS that runs for that period of execution, right? And once it is loaded, that's when you see, if it's a Windows machine, then you see all these icons, the startup menu, that Windows background in your desktop. If you have a Mac, you will have that Apple logo and then you will have the Apple apps on your device, whatever device you're using, computer or smartphone, that's when you actually get to understand that, okay, the computer is now ready for your usage. So from switching on to that, switching on that power button in your device to be able to actually execute, there are like millions of clock cycles that, that are spent in doing all these steps. And since each step takes nanoseconds, so nanoseconds into millions of millions of cycles is probably some two or three seconds, right? So in two or three seconds, your computer is ready for your use. So that is what goes behind the scenes, okay? So if you own a Linux system, try to do an escape probably or F2, sometimes it's F2 as well while it's loading so that it takes you to the bootloading page and you can understand what the system is going through. You can see the physical checks and that's what is also used in your forensic analysis in your computers and everything. They look up into your bootloading sequence to identify, okay, what are the processes which has happened uh, by the uh, before you switch on your computer, right? There's a question in chat. Well, what is it regarding? Can somebody identify it? Oh, uh, they're asking how is solid state not volatile? We are going to talk about solid state. Don't worry. Okay. So, so we have some upcoming uh, uh, slides. So I'll talk more about those. Right. So now we are going to talk about this one. Uh, so, so this is what happens in the RAM. Okay. So, so basically, your memory. Uh, you have some space which is allocated for your OS, which is zero to two GB. Then you have something related to your code and text data, heap, and stack. So that's how your main memory is allocated. And there is a space reserved in your memory for your OS, which is always there even after switching off your computer, right? So let's introduce uh, these 
terminologies and you can read this page in detail to understand the flow okay so units of memory okay so when you see cap uh, uppercase b it is bytes and when you see a lowercase b it is bits so 1 kb is kilobytes everybody knows it's 2 raised to power 10 bytes megabytes is 2 to the power 20 giga is 2 to the power 30 so we have learned like in all these months we have at least learned these three right now we are going to introduce some higher order uh, memories tb okay everybody knows a tb terabyte what does it mean it's basically 1024 gigabytes that means you add another two you multiply another two raised to the power 10 to two raised to the power 30 so it will be two raised to the power 40. then we have petabytes which is 1024 terabytes like an order of thousand right so you keep multiplying thousand you get to a higher order so two raised to the power 40 into 1024 is two raised to the power 50. then exabyte is basically two raised to the power 60. If you see this one, this is basically gigabit squ gigabyte square. It's giga square, basically. So it's basically 2 raised to power 60 bytes or 2 raised to power 30 GB. Right? So when you, when you have a 64-bit architecture, that's the amount of memory you can use. But the, but the hard drives or anything you have only is up till TB, right? One terabyte. So how, how do we take into account that mismatch, right? And that's where the concept of virtual memory comes in, okay? So this is a fun fact. Uh, all the data in this entire world is reported to be 60 exabytes so far. And most of the data is generated in the past 10 years with uh, advent of big data and all these devices and sensors, right? Now let's take our discussion to memory technologies. And uh, I'll quickly go over these so that you can take some time after this lecture to read in details. So we're going to introduce like two types of uh, technologies broadly. One is like volatile and another is non-volatile. And within non-volatile, we have two, fam uh, two families, okay? So non-volatile basically means something which is going to survive your which is going to like survive in your memory even after the power is switched off right so we can say it's in terms of permanent but then again it's a relative what you mean by permanent because eventually every storage element degrades over the period of time that's why after three four years you will realize that okay your performance of your computer is no longer same because your battery has gone bad just like uh, and probably your RAM devices, they start, and your memory devices start losing their charge. Okay, so so what non-volatile here basically means that if you switch off your computer, you switch it back on. Those are the things which are still saved, right? So, so in that regard, when you talk about permanent offline storage, right? So there are two types of storages. One is tape drive and DNA. So there is a concept of synthetic DNA where people are trying new technologies, just like human DNA, to store the data as a DNA sequence. So watch these two videos, which will help you understand how they, they are stored. Okay, these are short videos, but those are with animations and graphics, which makes it fun to watch. So the whole idea is, instead of storing it into hard drives or anything, how about we bring that data and store it just like, just like a protein base pairs for the human DNA, let's store that data onto the DNA. So that means all of the data can be stored in a compact way in, in a sense that as more and more data is generated, we don't have to run after a lot of memory, the traditional memory. So DNAs can store a lot of data compared to a traditional memory. Okay, so watch those videos, those are fun. Uh, then there's something called as non-volatile permanent online storage. Now that's where this discussion of traditional hard drive and solid state drives come in, right? So HDD and SSD, right? So these are very uh, popular these days if you're buying a device, when you check those specs. Specifically, if you go to Lenovo, like I have this experience, whenever I go to Lenovo website, 
you get a chance to customize your device right and then they will talk about okay do you want to get a one tb hdd or do you want to replace it with a 256 gigabytes of ssd or 128 gigabytes of ssd right so ssd is a modern technology hdd is a little bit older now the difference is hdd is all about mechanical it has a proper mechanical device rotors and everything whereas ssd is based on this uh, technique of uh, there is no mechanical part as you can see here and it's based on your digital and power supplies and all those things it does not have a mechanical unit which actually functions based just like hdd right um question if it's purely mechanical then how does it not fall for the same issue of running out of power and losing everything just like your cd cd drives everything is recorded in your cd and even if your power is switched off so suppose your your external hard drives your internal hdds your cd roms those are all fall fall into this category right because you store that data and then it is there your your flash drives right and the way you read this is through for example in this uh, hard drive you have like a, a kind of a disk controller that moves if you have the vinyl records and everything like when the music was stored in vinyls vinyl records and everything so it's the same concept it's a permanent storage got it right and the solid state drive is an alternative and if you see these modern computers mostly have these ssds which is a newer technology which is faster but because it's more expensive you cannot do 1 tb of ssd that would be much more expensive than a 1 tb hdd that's why it's better to have a 256 gb ssd than a 1 tb hdd obviously the price would be a little bit a point where you have to distinguish between the two but then the performance of ssd is much better okay it's a faster access and the technology is not dependent on mechanical failures or anything in hdd if there's a mechanical failure you have to replace your hard drives okay so i encourage you guys to read here read this and then watch the corresponding videos right and then we talk about volatile dynamic storage right and so these class of memories is fast but it loses data when powered off right so this is to do with the DRAM and SRAM. So DRAM stands for dynamic random access memory and SRAM stands for static random access memory. Okay. And SRAM is again a faster memory compared to DRAM. So all these memory technologies are based on how quickly you can access data, right? Because if your CPU is requesting something from your storage devices, then you should be able to reduce that time of how much time does it take to get to that request the ram to give me that data and then bring it back right so the faster the technology in which the concept of ram is based better is it for your computer to do fast processing but then to make it to make sram better than dram you have to invest in that technological development and r d right and that takes again money so you, you have to take into account that, okay, if you're using an SRAM compared to a DRAM, your devices might have, might be more expensive for a lesser capacity, but the performance might increase because it has a faster read and write times. Okay. So that brings our discussion to this memory performance we have been like talking a lot about right so there are two important metrics to measure a memory performance one is bandwidth the other one is latency now how we define bandwidth is it is basically rate of data transfer how many bits or bytes of memory can you transfer in a unit time so it has the unit of per second right so bandwidth can be a bits per second in this case, right? So that means if your hard drive or memory has like, let's say it has like 10 gigabits per second, 
right? What does it basically mean? It basically means it can transfer 10 gigabits every second. So that rate of transfer is called as bandwidth, right? So the emphasis is on quantity per unit time. So higher the bandwidth, better is it for you. Faster the read and write would be. And read and write, reading and writing from the memory can have different bandwidths as well. Now, latency is basically the unit is time to start off with. And latency basically means how much time does it take to go for, to issue the command, starting from issuing a command from CPU to the memory and then returning with that data requested. So if you remember your hack CPU design, there was this write M output which goes into the load of the physical memory. And then you had an address M from the CPU, which goes into the address of the physical memory from your project file. Now, the amount of time it takes from CPU to go to the memory, request that data, and then return back to the ALU where it was requested from. That time is called latency. And the whole idea is to reduce this time how can I reduce the time to grab the data from my memory? So, the, so, so it's completion of read and write, right? So you can see that it is measured as the product of, now latency is basically given as a product of clock cycle time. That means time per cycle, because every instruction takes some clock cycles to be executed. In hack computer, we have assumed that every instruction that you write in assembly takes one clock cycle, but it is, it is not necessarily the case. Some instructions might take multiple clock cycles. So latency is defined as clock cycle time multiplied by number of clock cycles for that instruction, right? So if I tell you that, okay, this assembly instruction takes four clock cycles to be executed and each clock cycle is two nanoseconds. That means the amount of time to execute that instruction is four clock cycles multiplied by two seconds per clock cycle. So clock cycle, clock cycle cancels, so it is eight nanoseconds, right? So that is the amount of time to do that operation. So latency is in terms of time and bandwidth is in terms of per second, per unit time, right? And with this different DRAM generations, which is DDR3 and 4, these values more or less change depending on the technology, right? Then uh, let's wrap this lecture with this final discussion on memory addressing, and then we can continue uh, on Thursday. So by default, memory is considered as byte addressable. That means given any address, you can identify the register, which is a byte. So, so far we have taken register to be 16 bits which is two bytes, right? So here we are learning the fact that memory in modern computers can be accessed in two ways. Either it can be byte addressable or word addressable. Byte addressable basically means eight bits, which is one byte. Word addressable basically means four bytes at a time, which is 32 bits. Right. So when I say that, so word addressable is four bytes, right? So in our computer, so let's say, let's take this example. If a memory has a capacity of X bytes, then a byte can be located with an address composed of log X to the two bits, right? Because let's say we have 32 bytes. Our memory is in total 32 bytes. Now, if it is a byte addressable memory, that means every location with, with an address, I can identify a unique byte of memory. 
then I have log 32 to the base two. That means I have, I need to have five address bits to identify any of those 32 bytes. In this case, think of byte as registers to draw that analogy. A register can store eight bits, suppose, right? So we have 32 registers or 32 bytes, and then you need only five address bits. Now, if our memory is 16 kilobytes, and if it's a byte addressable system, then we will need 14 address bits. So with 14 address bits, I can uniquely identify 16 K bytes. Does that make sense? In that same vein, let's try to uh, solve this final example for today's class. If you have a 128 KB memory, kilobyte. Now, if the memory is byte addressable, that means anytime you get an address, you fetch one byte from the memory. Then how many physic, how many bits are needed for the physical address? Well, 128 KB means 128 kilobytes. So 128 K is log of two raised to power 17 to the base two, which is 17 bit. Because 128 is two raised to power seven, K is two raised to power 10. And bytes is same as this byte, right? So two raised to power 17 bytes are there in the memory. So I need 17 bits. But if the same memory is word addressable, now if you organize the memory such that you can access one word at a time, that means for every address, you can access bunch of 32 bits at a time. So 32 bits is four bytes, right? Four bytes is called as a word, right? So that means with 128 KB, how many words can you make? Well, we know one word is four bytes. So 128 KB divided by four, which is 32 K, right? 32 KB, right? So now what is the physical address? Two raised to log of 32 K to the base two, which is 15. So I would need 15 bits of address so that every sequence of 15 gives me an location of a word and that word would be bunch of four bytes right so you can imagine that every register is basically 32 bits wide so try to think in that aspect so this memory design is what we are going to look into in upcoming lectures so we can see that memory can be organized in four different ways so these are four different ways in which you can store your sequence of eight bytes. You can store them in a vertical fashion, zero to seven. You can store it in a horizontal fashion, or you can store it in a 2D format, your eight bytes. So we'll talk more about this and how we can address each of this cell based on their organization. So with that, I want to wrap today's lecture and on Thursday, we're going to continue our discussion on this. So before Thursday, please give it a read for all these uh, pages. It's it's similar to what we are discussing here. And please watch these YouTube videos to complement uh, our learning and just to have that visual cues on how everything works and what it means to be an SRAM, DRAM and all those definitions. Okay. Any questions? Um, not on. Okay. So yeah, so until last time we talked about the bio setup, right? So hopefully you were able to appreciate how it works. Uh, then we talked about the fact that every program that we are running is called as a process. That means any application that you have on your computer, once it starts executing, that means once you double click that application, it starts running, it is now, now called a process. And how that is done is for every process that is running on your computers, this is a kind of the memory map for that process. Like first few segments of the memory are reserved for the OS, right, which is basically to, to ensure that it is getting loaded into your physical memory. 
then the code the, the application it's itself a code so it knows it needs to know what that code is then the data associated with that code like if you're running with microsoft excel or microsoft powerpoint slide or if you're running a whatever editor you are using right so all these are like applications which are running and then there is a segment of memory called as heap which is like dynamic for the dynamic memory and then there's the stack which like rises and falls right the stack memory so as you have functions and function calls then you have these variables which are getting stored in the stack and when you exit from these function calls then the stack pops right so it, so it grows and shrinks so for each process what the computer does is it creates a kind of this mapping like this is what the program view is right and for a 64 bit architecture right so these modern computers these are like 64 bit architectures right 32 to 64 so when we say 64 bit architecture it means the address or the instruction bits are 64. That means how many, so what is the size? If, if, if you have 64 bits of address, then what is the size of the memory? Two raised to power 64. And two raised to power 64 is basically 16 into two raised to power 60, right? And then we learned from here that two raised to power 60 is a new uh, unit which we call as exabytes, right? So that means every process is, is being guaranteed this 16 EB space. But we all know that the, the RAM that is there in my laptop that I'm using right now is 16 GB. Forget about EB, it's a 16 GB RAM. Even the hard drives that we have are in terabyte, right, TB. Right, and this is talking in terms of 16 EB, right? So all these modern computers have these kind of uh, element where you give an illusion, basically, that every process has this much memory allocated to itself, each process. But in reality, these process, these processes or programs are not that memory intensive, right? Those can be in few MBs. But that is the beauty of what we're going to learn today is virtual memory. That even though you have like 10, 20 applications running simultaneously, but the way the computer guarantees that you get a space on physical memory, even though it's limited, is through this concept of virtual memory. That means you give an illusion that everybody has an exclusive infinite memory for practical purposes. So 16 EB is infinite, basically. Because if your modern computer systems are in from the hardware perspective is TB, and if your RAM is in GB, then 16 EB is like practically infinite. And this was done because if you see earlier, we had a 32-bit architecture, right? Some of the computers today are still 32-bit architecture. So if a 32-bit architecture, how, how much is the memory? 2 raised to power 32, right? Which is 2 raised to power 34, 4 GB, right? 2 raised to power 32 is basically 4 GB, which is still doable, right? 4 GB makes sense that, okay, suppose every process that you're using needs a 4 GB space. So probably we can provide hardware for that, for 4 GB, 4 GB. But then the computer designers thought that as, as the computations and applic applications become more intensive, so let's create a 64 bit architecture so that we do not have to worry about increasing all these memory addressing every year because it will take a lot of time for us to reach the exabyte order right so that's why the decision was made that from 16 bit architecture let's straight away jump to 32 from a 32 bit architecture let's jump to 64 bit architecture and not 33 34 35 otherwise after every few years you have to change the entire mapping of your computers in upcoming devices and then think about, okay, now we have to increase the capacity and everything for the memory addressing. But now with 64-bit architecture, we can be rest assured that we're not going to run out of memory for each process. Now this memory we are talking about is the virtual memory, right? And we're going to study more about it. So in the course of previous lecture, we also introduced different types of memory technologies. 
So please go over this and they are like supporting videos. There was a question on high bandwidth memory by Samir. So I got to know it from the chat after the class. So high bandwidth memory is a 3D stacked memory. So far we are talking about memory in 2D. Now in high, high bandwidth memory is basically you have a 3D structure, like RAM over RAM over RAM. So that means you have vertical connections across RAM, which creates this 3D packing and makes it high bandwidth. So again, there's a video for it in the, so I posted it, this, this, all the links in the discuss lectures on Canvas. So I recommend that you actually supplement your knowledge with those videos, right? Then we talked about memory performances, which was latency and bandwidth. So as I told you, what latency is, is basically starting from the CPU, the request from the CPU all the way to the memory, fetching the data from the memory and then returning back to the CPU. This entire process, whatever time it takes, is called latency for that instruction. Now bandwidth. So bandwidth is the maximum number of bits that can pass through a system per second. Now bandwidth is a property of a cable. Now the best analogy I can give you is a highway. So if, if you have a highway with four lanes and under idle scenario, you have 100 cars that can pass per minute, then the bandwidth of that highway is 100 cars per minute, right? So that is the maximum possible transmission rate that is possible for in that cable or in that channel. That is what the bandwidth is. But there's also another notion called as throughput, right? So there's a bandwidth and throughput and latency. So latency is a unit of time. It's in seconds, milliseconds, nanoseconds. Latency and bandwidth are both in terms of per unit time. So in bandwidth, you might have heard that, okay, I have a hundred Gbps ethernet, right? Hundred gigabytes per second, right? That can be the maximum transmission rate possible in that cable. But in reality, do we, do, do we see that? No, there can be some devices which are connected across these cables, which cannot support that much traffic. Similarly on a highway, because of, some, because of a congestion and everything, you do not have 100 cars passing per minute at every instant of time. So whatever actual amount of data is being sent in that second is called as throughput of that system, right? So throughput is a more practical and realistic thing, whereas bandwidth is the ideal scenario if there was no congestion or anything, right? So please be careful on these terminologies. Again, there's a link I have posted on a discuss lectures which distinguishes between bandwidth and latency, bandwidth and throughput. But both the units are in BPS, which is bits per second or Hertz because per second is anyways hurts, right? Okay, so we ended last lecture in terms of our discussion on memory addressing. So by default, uh, so, so if we see the hack computer, like our every, like each register in our RAM was 16 bits, right? Which was two bytes, right? A byte is an eight bit. So by default, the hack computer was designed that it was, two bytes, like every every register. But in modern computers, uh, what we say is memory by default is byte addressable. That means anytime you address a location, you're going to pick up one byte at a time. That means eight bits, right? So when I say this memory is byte addressable, that means if I have a location like zero X five, so all the locations are given in hexadecimal, right? So when you have the screen 16,384, 16,385, in reality, all these numbers are given in hexadecimal format because the, these can run all the way up till eight GB or whatever it is, right? So that big number is better represented with hexadecimal. So when I say, okay, uh, anytime I address a location says zero X F5, right? Then, when I reach that location, I can grab one byte at a time. That means eight bits in one shot. So it's called as byte addressable. Now, some memories can be created so that those are word addressable. Just be careful, right? Byte addressable versus 
word addressable. Now, one word is basically four bytes, which is 32 bits. So if we say that this memory is organized in a word addressable format, then we are saying that, okay, one word is four bytes. So that means anytime I go to an address as 0x a b or 0x a c, I can get 32 bits in one shot, which is four bytes or one word, right? So, so in terms of our hack computer, word was defined as two bytes because you are grabbing 16 bits at a time, right? That's why if you remember the memory mapping formula, they use the term called as word, right? Go to this word, grab that RAM, and then color that bit as zero or one, right? So in that hack computer, word was defined as two bytes, which is 16 bits. But here, if we say that in modern computers, one word is basically four bytes, which is 32 bits, okay? So based on that, we have this uh, examples where we say that, okay, if our memory is 32 bytes, right? Then how many address bits do we need? Well, if we say it's a byte addressable memory, that means I have to only worry about 32. If, because if there are 32 bytes, that means there are 32, you can think of it as there are 32 registers where every register is one byte. So 32 is log 32 to base two, which is five. So I need five address bits. Similarly, if I have 16 K bytes in a byte addressable memory, I have to only worry about 16 K, which is two raised to power 14. So I would need 14 address bits to uniquely identify 16 K bytes, right? Now, based on that, we again had these examples here. Like if you have a 128 KB memory, now if the memory is byte addressable, the number of bits for its physical address, again, it, it basically means number of addressing bits is 17, right? 128 is two raised to power seven, K is two raised to power 10. So basically you need 17 bits. But now if the memory is somehow arranged as word addressable, where the word size is 4B, that means every word is four bytes, right? Then we have to find out how many words are there, right? So basically we can do 128 KB divided by 4B, that means there are 32 KB. So now 32 KB means two raised to power 15, right? So I need 15 bits to uniquely identify a location and that, that location is basically a word. That means we have four bytes in that location, right? So it's basically a 2D structure. Think of it as a matrix, right? So word addressable basically will take you to a matrix where you have four blocks in each row and then there are 32K rows. So let's see an example of the way, the different ways we can organize the memory, okay? So single column means, okay, if you have location zero, it is sitting here. If you want to go to location one, it is right at top of it and you go, go from bottom to top, right? Now there's an, another a single row format where your values are stored from right to left. Okay, so this is one byte, this is the other byte, this is the next byte. Please remember these are not bits. This is how your RAM view probably looks like if it is stored in a single row fashion. But, but the better way to organize your memory is in a 2D format. So this is a four cross two organization where we have four entries or four rows and each row has two bytes. 0th byte, one byte, right? That means every row is having 16 bits, but again in 16 bits, the 0th byte is sitting here and then the next byte is sitting here, right? In a two cross four format, you have two entries. So horizontal things are called as entries. You have two entries and each entry is four byte. Now this is word addressable. That every row that you go, you get you can have four bytes stored in that location, 
So they are all mapped to row zero or entry zero. So the next four bytes are mapped to entry one. Now, when we have these different ways of organizing memory, then we have to be careful on how we need to address it. For example, in a single column, if you know the address is zero, right? Then now one thing common across these four organizations is number of memory units, right? So here you can see there are eight units of memory or eight bytes of memory, right? Because every cell is a byte. So you have eight bytes of memory, right? So in that case, if we arrange the memory in this single column, right? So we say we arrange it in a single column, then if you if you are looking for byte number five, then what is the address for it? Well, if we have eight bytes, then how many address bits do we need? Three in a byte addressable format, right? Zero to seven, three bits. So it's easy. We can just say 101 entry address, and that will take us to that corresponding row or entry. So if you're looking for byte five, you simply have to say 101. It will go to the entry number five, which is this one, right? Now, if you arrange it in a single row, then, then all these columns are called as byte, right? So, so imagine that all these horizontal rows are called as entries. That's why we call it an entry address. And all these vertical partitions are called as bytes, right? That's why we call it as byte offset. So the same example, let's say in this organization of single row, right? Let's say we are looking for byte number four, which is this one, right? If I'm looking for byte number four, right? Then the way to organize it is, well, it is four. So one zero zero corresponds to four. So anytime I have um, addressing like one zero zero, it would give me this location four, right? So this is easy because it's all linear. Now in parts in the C, we have a 2D structure, right? Now we have a coordinate system here, like entry comma byte. So far here we had eight entries and the same zeroth byte. Here we had one entry and eight bytes. Now we have this 2D layout. So we have four entries, which are entry number zero, one, two, three, and we have two bytes per entry, which is byte zero, byte one. Now look into this four cross two organization. Now we have four entries each with two bytes. Therefore the address is partitioned into two fields. So again, how many, how many bytes in total we have? Still eight. That means we still need three bits of address. But this address is now going to be partitioned so that you can locate that target byte in that 2D layout. So how are you going to partition? Well, look into this one. Your number of bytes is two, which are vertical columns. So how many bits do you need for vertical columns? One, one bit is sufficient to identify one of these two columns. Now, number of entries are four. How many bits do you need to uniquely identify an entry number? Two. So from the three bits, we have to find out one bit and reserve it for byte offset. And the remaining two, remaining two bits here would be for my entry address. So look into this one. If I'm looking for something called as entry address of two bits and byte offset of one bit, right? So for example, row one and entry one. Row one, row one, and entry one, right? So I think, yeah, so row one and entry one will be zero one for the row and one for the entry. Okay, they, let's look into this one carefully, right? One for the entry and zero one. So look into this one. We, we realize that the byte is one bit, right? Now, the first goal is to find out which row you have to enter 
and once you have identified the row then find out what which byte you have to go right so naturally if you see the higher two bits should correspond to entry because if you see if you create this truth table right truth table or this 000 till 111 so this byte offset here changes at every step right triple zero then zero zero one then zero one zero that means for every pair of a to a one we have two possible values of a zero so that means a two and a one would be mapped to my entry address and a zero would decide whether it's zero or one right so if i have to go to this location right which is two comma one here so what would be the address can you write down the address if i have to enter this location where the where we see the mouse so it's entry 2 which is 10 and then byte 1 so byte offset is 1 so it should be 101 do we have 101 great now let's try this one entry 1 byte 0 so entry 1 means the the entry bits the entry address is 01 and because this is in byte 0 the the least significant bit the byte offset is 0 so it should be 010 do we have 010 great okay so you can see how the numbers are arranged right so if we have triple zero like 000 it is sitting here 001 010 011 100 so this is 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 that's how it's arranged all the eight eight bytes this one is 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 all the eight bytes right in this case it's 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 all the eight bytes right so this is starting from bottom right so it's going like this right if i have to annotate okay that's how it is going now let's try to find out the next organization so in this case going in the same lines as we discussed right now think about this one again there are eight cells or eight bytes so again we need three address bits now how would you partition the three address bits so that you can identify one unique location amongst this eight so how many bits do i need for entry now for entry i need only one bit and how many bits do i need for columns or the byte offset 2 that means the most significant bit the most significant bit right the most significant bit can be yeah this one right So in this case, the most significant bit would be the entry, and the remaining one would be the byte offset. Does that make sense? So, so, so if we are looking at zero zero zero, right? So that means zero. So if let's look into this one, right? now let's try to find this cell right even though you know it's 6 because it says there but let's try to answer why let's look into this one which is 1 comma 2 entry 1 byte 2 right now if it is 1 then your entry address bit is 1 now since it is sitting at byte number 2 or the column 2 the remaining bits is representing 2 10 right so in together this is representing 6 that means this one is 6 so if you see here the mapping is done 0 1 2 3 4567 so the mapping is done like this does it make sense so your 
would be here. If you have all the three address bits as zero, you would be here, right? If you have zero, one, zero, it would be sitting at zero and one, zero. This is two. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those are the eight bytes. Any questions so far in terms of mapping? So the way you lay out your memory, you have to then decide how you're going to uh, uh, how are you going to partition this address sequence so that you find the entry address and byte offset? Let me know if there are any questions. You can unmute and ask. Okay, great. So in, in, in that similar line, what we were going to introduce is this concept of indirection, right? Now we have already gone over this concept while we are while we constructed our muxes. The idea here is given a sequence of address, one way of organizing it is if you have selection, right? If you have two bits of here, you have like three bits of selection. Either you can design your memory like this right where you want to say that okay one input comes in and then i have eight potential outputs sitting there right or another approach is to split the design in a hierarchical stage where you say that okay i'm going to partition my selection bits in a such a way that the most significant bit is going to choose between the top set or the bottom set and the next two bits are going to help me figure out the exact address within that set, right? So as you see here from selection two, you can partition it into top block and bottom block with four units in each block. And then to identify across this four, you can use the remaining two bits. You can make it a three stage design by further dividing it into one is to two. Right, then it would be a perfect binary tree. Right. So again, if you see the address, the selection bits here, the first design, you can purely do it like this, or you can say that okay, for the level one, I'm going to rely on selection two, but for the level two, I'm going to rely on the row two bits. So with this indirection, you can map your 2D memory structures, right? Because one can go to entry, the other one can go to the byte offset to be able, to, because that's the whole idea that we did anyways here, right? So that should not be surprising, right? So let's look into this example. We have four MB, right? We have a memory of four MB, right? Which stands for how many address bits? So if you have a four MB space, how many address bits do you need? 22, right? M is two raised to power 20 and four is two. So you need 22, right? And now there are two ways to organize this memory. If you organize it in version one, which is just one column here, right? One column, then each entry is suppose one byte in a byte addressable scheme. It is one byte. Every cell is one byte. So you will have addressing starting from zero all the way till two raised to power 22 minus one, right? Because those are the number of registers you want to say or number of entries, right? That means your address bits, which are 22 bits, you have to read them, decode them and enter that specific row. That's it to get the target address. But in version two, suppose we organize it in a word addressable format where every entry is storing four bytes, right? So byte zero, byte one, byte two, byte three. So every cell is eight bits. In total, this is 32 bits. But and then we have how many entries? So first question is out of this 22, entry out of these 22 bits, right? How much are your entry bits and how many are your byte offset? Going by the same logic, 
how will we see this is we have four vertical rows so how many bits of address do i need to un to to identify a particular column well two bits right and if i need two bits to find my byte offset then remaining 20 bits will be used will be used to um, identify the entry hello yes sorry like my uh thing briefly like crashed uh <laughs> What did, did I miss anything like just this last minute or two? Or are you just going over questions as usual? I was going over this question. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. So, is this question clear? The same address bits can the same address of twenty two bits can be viewed in two different ways based on how you are organizing your memory. Either it can be twenty two entry bits, or like we have seen in this example, we can have twenty entry bits and the trailing two bits are your byte offset. Okay, cool. So, so expect similar questions, okay? If we say, okay, this much is the memory, and if I organize it, it like this, right? Then how many, then how, how would you identify the number of bits reserved for entry and number of bits reserved for byte? Cool. So finally, I want to wrap up this lecture 13 that we started last time by revisiting a concept that we had introduced earlier, which was memory hierarchy. So the idea behind memory hierarchy is we want to make our computations far. JD, before you uh, keep going, so here's a question. Uh, where? Okay, question. Uh, for each entry, we have four bytes. It's not a 32-bit register. That is how the memory is organized in a 2D way. If you if you if you take your memory chip, the way it is organized is in a 2D format. Right? So it's, it's not one register which is 32 bits. Yeah, you can think of it as a cell. Every cell is storing eight bits and you are in your actual motherboard, you have this chip where you are putting it in a 2D layout. So your memory that is being shipped to you, whatever memory you have, it already is in a 2D format. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like a square or a rectangle rather than one linear, uh, one rather than one long memory, which is vertical or horizontal, you have a squarish structure. Okay, cool. So, so let's introduce this, uh, revisit this concept of memory hierarchy. And the entire goal is to reduce the latency. That means the time taken from the CPU to grab the data from the memory and return back to the CPU. And the analogy we uh, discussed in all these lectures so far is imagine you are cooking a recipe and for cooking that one dish, you don't have to go to your HEB for every ingredient. What you do, because it takes time, it takes time to leave your house, drive all the way to the HEB, fetch or collect that grocery item, go to the cashier, then travel back all the way back to your kitchen. It takes time. It's the same concept. So what we do is we go to HEB once a week. At least I do that. <laughs> so I go to HEB once a week, get all that I would need in one go and store it in my pantry. And whatever I want to cook each day, I would take only those ingredients from my pantry and then cook it. Now that saves me time from going to HEB every day to, to cook my meal, right? Is the exactly same concept. HEB is far and it is huge. Whereas my kitchen pantry is close, is next to my kitchen, but it has a smaller capacity. And if I talk about my counter, it is again a smaller space than my pantry, 
but then to access something from my counter which is next to my stove is much quicker than my pantry which is much quicker than going all the way to hgb is the same concept your cpu is your stove registers is your counter think of cache memory as your pantry physical main memory is your hgb and your persistent file based memory is basically the whatever you want to say maybe these are your local farmers or anything where the hgbs get that data like whatever the groceries where wherever they collect that item from right so these are arranged in a way that you have an increasing distance from the cpu from top to bottom so as you go from top to bottom you are going farther away from cpu that means if your data is not available on cpu you have to check the registers if it is not there in the registers you have to check it in the cache if it is not in the cache you have to check the main memory if it's not in the main memory or ram you have to check your hard drive which is your persistent file based memory hard drives or external drives whatever it is right and naturally further you go away from the cpu your file sizes your memory sizes increases so naturally your registers are smaller in size which are typically in terms of bytes your cache is in kb or megabytes your rams are these days in gb whereas your external devices are in tb right so that is how everything is arranged and and if we did not have these hierarchies so every time we do not have a data in cpu i have to run all the way to main memory or disk so what we do is create these checkpoints so we have partitioned the entire memory into these different so the journey that a uh, journey that a request takes from the cpu to the memory and return with the data is now it has now has to now go through these various checkpoints and at each checkpoint there is a there is a storage location offered and any time you have a data in cache then you conserve the time to run all the way to main memory so you grab the data from cache and then return to your cpu which is faster so this is how the memory is now organized in your computer and each memory has a different technology ssd technology or if you have a file storage it has a different technology your cache has a your cache are based based on sram technology right so as so that's why the the memory elements which are closest to your cpu are the fastest but they also are expensive technologies that's why you cannot afford to have a lot of them so it's a trade off okay hope we can appreciate this right okay all right so and now there are two ways uh, so the so so uh, so the take home point from this is the closer a memory is to cpu faster it is and fast memories are also not as dense in capacity and are also expensive right because these are not dense you can fit it on the chip now there are two principles uh, of locality that we have to understand and probably some of you might already know this but for any program that you run let's imagine you have a for loop uh where you need to accumulate the sum of an array okay so you have to run run through a for loop and in every iteration you are grabbing an array element and then you are accumulating the sum that means you have a body of that code sum plus equals array i and you have a for loop with an iterating variable i which is running through 10 iterations for an array of size 10 right so you need to basically do sum is equal to 0 plus array 0 plus array 1 plus array 2 up till array 9 now when you see this pseudo code now which are the variables which you are going to use in every iteration which variables do you need to will you be using in every iteration
So you have a sum variable, which is the accumulator that is being accessed in every iteration and your iterating variable i or j, whatever it is, because you have to jump through that index, right? At every iteration, you're incrementing your index. Great. So these variables need to be used again and again. So it is in your best interest that the program or the computer stores these variables closest to the CPU, right? And the reason why it will store it closest to the CPU is because of this fact that any memory location that has been accessed at time t has a higher probability that it's going to be accessed again in t plus one. It may or may not be, but there's a high probability that a variable that you have just invoked and used it for the first time, probably it's going to be used again. So let's store that variable next to the CPU, which is on the register or on cache. Maybe for the first time you did not have that. So you went to the RAM, you did that hard task of going to the RAM, returning from the RAM, and now you have used it in the first iteration. Now, the way this locality works is your I and sum will be stored temporarily onto your register. Why? Because there's a probability that it can be used again. And given this for loop, indeed I and sum are going to be used again and again. Because if you do not make this copy of sum on the, on the register, then see your sum value is being updated in every instance. If you do not provide this locality, then see what is happening in the first iteration. So you declare and initialize your sum as zero outside the loop. And how do you initialize it? Well, you check your register. There is nothing called as sum. So you run all the way to the RAM, grab that location, which is sum, bring it to your D register, right? Or whatever register data register you have on chip. Now that sum is incremented, is initialized to zero, right? And after first iteration, suppose you have sum as 10. Now, if you do not store it onto the register, that means at every iteration, you have to run all the way back to the RAM and then update that location with a new value 10. So to save this time to run all the way to the RAM to keep updating that location, you save that on the chip and keep updating it until the program ends. And at the very end, you write that value onto the RAM. So you have conserved the time to run to RAM in every iteration. So this, so sum and I exhibit temporal locality. Similar, similar thing with I, because I is incrementing by one in every iteration. What is the spatial locality? In this, in this array example, what variable or object denotes a spatial locality? Spatial locality means if a location has been addressed, there's a high chance that it's nearby locations can be accessed again. So the array object exhibits a spatial locality because if array I is being used, is a high probability that the surrounding regions of that memory are still being, will also be used. So rather than just fetching array zero from the RAM, what it would do is it will fetch the entire array. Because now understand what the meaning of array is. The name of the array is the base pointer. So if you just give the information of a base pointer and the size of the array, it will go to the main memory at the base pointer location look into these 10 consecutive memory locations, make a copy of that and bring it on chip. So, so, so to now to iterate through your array, it does not have to go to the RAM for every new index. It is already loaded. Your chip. How does it know like when to stop though? Like how does it know that it's on size? And you give the value 10 as well. Oh, okay. What is array box operator I? That box, that fancy box that we software engineers use. What is, the, what is that in core language? If you have programmed in C, you will appreciate pointers a lot. My, my first introduction to programming was through C, not even C++. So in C, 
everything you can use is through pointers. So when you say array box I, it basically means dereference the location ARR plus I, which is name of the array plus I, where I tells you how many bytes you have to jump through to get to the next location, right? So that's what temporal and spatial locality is all about. So these are the techniques that have been used to make sure that your computations are faster and all computers have these kind of properties these days. So whenever you want to get an array, you have to pass the address and its size, right? Remember in functions, how do you pass an array in call by reference mode? Int star, name of the array, comma, int size. Why do we do that? The same thing. You never pass array as an object directly as in a function parameter as well. You always have two fields for array. Int star ARR comma int size as your function parameters. All right. Cool. So are there any questions? It's difficult for me to read through all the chats. If there's anything which you want me to share or discuss, you can unmute and share. Okay, so finally, what we want to talk about is that once you have so many applications in your computer which you want to run simultaneously, how is it possible that we have a fixed physical RAM which is of like size 8 GB or 16 GB in modern computers, and then hope to run so many applications. And then also guarantee that every application will get its, get its deserved space on the memory, right? So this is all achieved by the illusion of virtual memory. And as the name suggests, virtual memory is not an actual physical memory. It's basically a concept where rather than when an application is loaded, rather than going to the main memory, it has to go through some kind of technique that we're going to introduce where every application thinks as if it's the only application that exists in the memory. Okay, it's, it's an illusion which is created through these techniques, right?